a game. We'll make this simple and we'll reconstruct the moment together. We'll start with the clear definitions and distributions of the roles. We'll start with you. We can agree you are the audience and that some moments ago the illusion of theatre was first found and then suddenly got blown away and now you're all hostages. Some of you are still actors, some of you are still musicians, some of you are dancers, some of you just paid to come and enjoy this, but now you're all really involved, you're embroiled, you're up to your necks in it, and you're a hostage to the situation which has unexpectedly taken place. Some of you are struck to bombs, and we might claim that you are also hostages. Bombs might be real and have explosive potential or they're just remnant, just properties of the play that was taking place here a few hours ago but nevertheless whether the bombs are real and they do look like bombs or just whether they look like bombs is at this stage not so important as the fact that the bombs are strapped to you. Having established that you are the audience, the hostages, it kind of has escaped your attention that I am a terrible actor. I mean, my acting is lamentable, woeful, or possibly best described as coarse. You've been told that I am dead. You've been told twice, officially, that I am dead. But here I am, right in the flesh, stood before you, and it's my birthday, and I'm going to rehearse my death. I'm going to die in this moment that we are going to reconstruct. That we are to reconstruct, to preserve the history and the historical insight. To reconstruct and remember everything that could have happened in the moment we are to rehearse. To remember all the antecedents and everything leading to this moment. To remember everything that came after the moment and to grasp what happened to whom and where and when and why in a simple model, a thorough reconstruction of cause and effect, an elucidation of the principles where cause is matched with effect and we comprehend how given conditions can result in, can result in the achievement of intentions, the purposes and all the causes as the impetus for the action. But for now we are trying together to arrive at some consensus about the making of the moment in causality and intention and purpose and role. We're agreed already that you are the audience, the hostages, and that some of you have always been the audience. Some were actors, and some were musicians, and that shortly after a dance, the theatre curtain came crashing down once, and no one wants that to happen again now that bombs might be involved. Bombs and guns. And the bombs might not be charged, primed, and set to detonate. But I'm holding a gun, and this is presumed real, and I will definitely be proving that it's fully functional in one moment when the woman enters. Under no circumstances should you speak, identify yourself will stand out from the crowd, so we know that a woman will enter. We've established that I am your worst nightmare of an actor and now your life is flashing before your eyes. Whenever nothing happens, your life is flashing before your eyes because you are convinced that you will die. And depending on your bent, may decide whether you live or die. Yes, depending on whether you are optimistic or pessimistic, may decide on whether you live or die tonight. You thought that you were here to watch, act, sing, dance, and now you are caught in this knot of life and death forces. It is almost as if you have decided already because you are involved, embroiled and up to an accident and your life is flashing before your eyes. Your life has been flashing before your eyes for some time now, so it has been your life flashing before you slowly. It might be that your cheery disposition, your zealous clinging to life will save you, whilst those who doubt, bemoan, suffer and resentfully live their life will be amongst the 
192 of you who will die later. It might be that some beautiful souls, some who live resentfully and some who have a zealous clinging to their life will be amongst the dead, will have observed that some of you are decidedly dead already in the future moment that we are rehearsing, but for others it will be down to chance. It will be arbitrary, undecided, and unrehearsed. We will establish that even in this rehearsal we can't account for who will and who won't die, and more precisely where or when. It might be in your seats, piled up in the buses because there isn't a single ambulance left available, or it might be because you were left on your back outside the theatre on the cold pavement. We don't know exactly who will die, where they will die, or when precisely death became an eventuality, but we might be able to balance the numbers between those of you who might have died when the bombs that possibly aren't bombs and could only threaten the idea of an explosion did in fact explode. You understand that it's simple, because the bombs might have been bombs and might have killed many more of you than will eventually die. We could say that none of you died if technically you are arbitrarily but decidedly dead already. I've been officially declared dead twice, so you can take heart from that, and I'm going to give you a super secret password that may or may not work in the eventuality of your death. It is the least that a terrible actor can give his audience. A super secret password to use just before the eventuality of your death. Some of you work in media. You all have mobile phones. You can text your friends, your family, your colleagues in the newsrooms and the television stations. Text the super secret password to your friends, your family, to your colleagues in the newsroom and the television networks, making sure that they broadcast my demands. And my demand is simple. End war. Cease and desist. I'm willing to die for that, and I'm glad that you're going to rehearse that belief with me. And you will join me in making this moment, the moment that we are going to rehearse. You can leave for the toilet now. I imagine you probably need to. You're probably shitting it, and not pissing yourself. Shitting yourself is something serious, whilst pissing yourself suggests something funny. This is serious shit. I'm not funny. I'm not pissing around and neither are you pissing yourself laughing. The show you were in or came to see wasn't a bundle of laughs either, so you didn't expect to be laughing much. We can agree to that. We can agree that I'm the worst nightmare idea of an actor who is in deep, but has not particularly got their head around the wall. I don't know my lines, they're like words off paper. I mean, you've been told that I'm dead on stage. I'm shockingly spoken and inarticulate, like I'm speaking a totally different theatrical language. Something alien, something uncomfortable, and not at all light entertainment. Something that isn't a nice piece of theatre that you're expected to be acting, singing, or dancing in, or watching someone acting or dancing. I'm not singing nor dancing or seemingly acting at all. It's something like I'm the one losing the plot. Something like I'm dying on stage here. Something that means I'm like a hostage. Just like you are under hostage for this moment and to the future. Some of you are pregnant and you can go. Some of you are Muslims and you can go. Some of you are internationals and you can go. Some of you are children and I will say that I want to let you go. The rest of you will have to shit and piss in the orchestra pit while we rehearse, so it's probably best if you go to the toilet now and climb out the window. Get out while you can, because this all changes when the young woman, the makeup counter girl, suddenly walks in and she'll ask you, why are you still sat in your seats? And the actors, the musicians, the dancers and audience will ask themselves the same question, as will some of you who sit strapped to what appear to be bombs. You will think, why am I still sat here? So we're clear. A young woman will enter. 
I mean, worst nightmare, but she's crazy. She's crazy walking in here like she does. Walking in with a hip swaggering, arm swinging, hooded determination. She's going to walk in here like she fucking owns the place, and when she does, you'll be pleading for her life. You'll say that she's drunk. We'll practice. You'll plead. She will come in, and she'll say something about me being a clown, this being a farce, and she'll ask you why are you still sat in your seat. And you will all plead to me, saying, Don't kill her. Can't you see she's drunk? She's not crazy. She's drunk and crazy. Some might use the term rogue. She's seen us on the television networks. She got the message and she's taken it upon herself as a citizen, as a have-a-go hero and as an actual agent provocateur. She's a little bit crazy, a little bit drunk, and more than a little indignant that there are children in here. This is the stuff of adults and there are children in here. The children might have been released were it not for the likes of her waltzing in here, a little bit drunk and indignant that there are children in here, so it's after three that you all say, Please, don't kill her. Can't you see she's drunk? Like you can talk to me at all. Please don't kill her. Can't you see she's drunk? Like a pantomime after the countdown. Please don't kill her. Can't you see she's drunk? Three, two, one. The bombs don't go off and I don't see that. I don't see her as crazy or drunk. In fact, I see her in a whole different light. That is what makes the moment that you see from your angle and I see from mine. We can agree that. We're going to see this moment from two totally different perspectives. You see it from over there, and I'll see it from over here. Which is somewhere over the other side of Europe that you all know. It's the other side of Europe, but it's still Europe. And other Europe that you might know as Asia. You'll see it from over there, then between you and me is a whole mountain range. And that is where the moment takes place. It's a range of mountains, and it's right here on stage like an elephant in the room. So between the hostages and the actors is a whole range of mountains, and there's a bathroom window to escape through, or a series of locked doors to get into the theatre with, with one left open that the makeup and perfume counter assistant will walk through. She'll walk in that she owns the place and enter the auditorium. There sits the audience and the actors. There's the range of mountains, but center stage are the bomb belts. The, the decisive factor in this, and they are strapped to young women, and they're sat with you. They're talking to you like you've known them for years. And in the moments where nothing happens, it is sometimes alright for you to talk to them. So they talk to you, and you talk about how sad the first half was, but how colorful the set and costumes were. You talk about the extortionate price of the sandwiches during the interval. You talk about understanding why they'd want to die right now. You talk about the role of women in Islam, and they remind you of the super secret password should death be imminent. But all that will change. All that will be lost when in a few moments she'll walk in. You won't even know who she is. Some of you will never know who she is. So it's all growing over. Her name is Olga Romanova. There. Those of you dead, or will be dead, will take that to your grave. To avoid any confusion, the Olga Romanova who you will see as the 26-year-old makeup counter assistant at the department store is not Olga Romanova, the executed Tsarina. But I don't see her in either light. We both know it isn't Olga Romanova, the executed Tsarina. She's officially dead. We know that doesn't always count for everything because I'm dead. We can agree that you've been told twice that I'm dead or in prison. Possibly I died in prison. If I'm willing to die here, I might have taken my life in prison, I suppose. I'll tell you that you would suppose wrong. Because taking my life in prison like that is not the same as this. In fact, you should know that were I to have died in prison, there is no way that it could have been me then. There is a difference between the two. Between me taking my life in prison there, and us rehearsing the taking of the lives here. There are rulings and decisions that you are involved in. 
You're taking responsibility for all of it. You are acting, singing, dancing, and sometimes talking your way through it. You have the super secret password ready and you're doing nothing, staying silent on the hole with your lives lasting before your eyes and some of you are dead already, and the guy on stage talking at you is dead already, so you can officially talk. So in the moments before Olga and Minova enters, nothing has been happening for quite some time. Nothing has happened since the acting and singing and dancing stopped and the curtain came down on the theatre and a man stepped on the stage firing a gun and then the acting was the best he'd ever seen and the theatre was the most gripping it had ever been. It was terrific. The moment the illusions were shattered it was everything you could desire from a show and its utter disbelief. More precisely, in the time between the theatre being blown away in disbelief by what was actually taking place and this actuality being registered by you, everything was perfectly executed. The look of fear on the actor's face, the terror in the rigid bodies of the dancers, and the way the orchestra suddenly stopped playing as if surprised because they were surprised, was electrifying performance. The first half had left you sad and the sandwiches were expensive, so you considered going home because you were tired, and the show was long, lasting from 1913 to 1943, but early in the second half, shortly after the interval with its overpriced consumables, this woke you up, this made you sit up straight in your seat, this widened your eyes, got your heart racing, got your nerves firing, hit straight to the bone, and you thought, what a trendy theatrical concept. When the man stood on stage and actually fired his actual gun with an actual bullet, and the actors were actually afraid, and the dancers actually terrified, and the orchestra actually stunned by surprise, you thought, what a trendy theatrical concept. That bright when the theatre was blown away, it reached the zenith of possible achievement in your eyes, heart, nerves, and bone. And then there was the disbelief that is left with your life flashing before your eyes and your family sat next to you, still terrified with nothing going on for quite some time. Your life has been flashing before your eyes, but slowly for quite some time now. It might be 11pm on the same night as the show, or 3am the next morning. Either way, those would both constitute quite some time. But we know that the young woman who is about to enter does it at either 11pm or 3am. And your life has been flashing before your eyes for quite some time now, so you're not sure whether it's 11am or 3pm. But she will enter only once. It isn't that the woman enters at 11pm and then again at 3am. It is that the woman enters at 11pm or 3am. It has to be quite some time that nothing has gone on because the young woman, quote, enters suddenly. Look, the script says suddenly a young woman entered. It doesn't name her. It doesn't say suddenly Olga Romanova entered. Perhaps it doesn't want to cause confusion. Perhaps it doesn't want reconstructions to have, say, Olga Romanova, the young Tsarina, executed in 1917 suddenly turning up in this moment that happened in 2002 during a play set between 1913 and 1943. We can all understand how the time of the play 1913 to 1943 might permit the entrance of the young Tsarina or Goromnova and possibly represent the night of her execution, but that wasn't in the show that you acted in, danced in, or sung in, or merely paid to come and enjoy. But between Olga Romanova, who you see as the 26-year-old perfume counter assistant from a department store, and the executed Tsarina, there's at least some grounds for understanding why when the young woman enters the auditorium claiming that the man on stage holding the gun is a clown, that this is all a masquerade and asking you why you are still in your seats, before demanding that you all get out, get out now. I am suspicious. 
you can understand established some common ground between me and the actor dying on stage and knew the audience as to why I might not think that she's a perfume counter assistant at all. We might agree that she looks 26, but I don't know any kind of perfume counter shop assistant that having watched this on television, having seen me holding you against your will, despite you having paid to sit in those very seats and be subject to a play about advancements in polar aviation circa 1913 to 1943 with some mention of the revolution, the civil war, the world war, the other revolution, the other civil war, and the other world war. Having seen that there are children and pregnant women and Muslims not wearing bomb belts and internationals including the Swedish diplomat among you who will die. She has seen you next to your family, she has seen the guns, the range of mountains, the wolves, the bomb belts and the black widows. We ever walk in here on my birthday like she owns the place. I don't know any perfume makeup counter assistant who would do that. Even if they were drunk and only maybe if they were crazy. And we can watch her in the TV news network cameras, walking across the car park trying the locked doors and walking into the theatre. She walks through the military, the police, and security cordon, like she fucking owns the place. We can watch her, just like the theatre camera saw the man walking on stage and shoot the gun, and the dancers stopped and the singing stopped and the acting was perfect. And the bullet hit the ropes and the ropes dropped the curtain onto the theatre as bomb belts, wolves, black widows and the range of mountains took to the stage and the actors became audience and this audience became a different kind of hostage to a different kind of fortune, fate, whatever arbitrary conditions may lead to the eventuality of their death, for which they have a super secret password. And in turn we are reminded in this rehearsal of the reconstruction may be the very death that you are called upon to perform. We're in this together. We're sharing the responsibilities and switching roles. I'm audience to your acts. I've seen you talking to the women strapped to the bomb belts. I've seen you stare with your life slowly flashing before your eyes. Shuffle in your seats, sneeze, sleep and snore. You're all going to snore like a bear. Like a whole clan of bears. The auditorium is going to be filled with a whole load of snoring later, much later, and some of you will choke on your tongues, and others will wake up and be told happy birthday before you finally walk out like the young makeup and perfume counter girl told you to. But as I've been saying, she's not a makeup and perfume counter girl at all from my perspective, from my position here over the range of mountains. No. From my perspective, the claim that Olga Romanova works in the department store is a cover. It's a role. She's a made-up makeup counter assistant at the two department store. Whilst really, she's working for the Federal Security and Counterterrorism Bureau, also known as the FSCTB. Olga Romanova is widely believed to be an FSCTB agent. But more pertinently, she is believed to be an FSCTB agent by me. You will look in disbelief at an apparently young beauty counter assistant from the Etude department store appearing drunk and suddenly appearing here asking, Why are you still sitting here? Calling me a clown and declaring this a farce and some kind of a masquerade, but in establishing some common ground here it is easier to see. Easier to grasp why I see her as an FSCTB agent provocateur sent in here to shake things up. It is in these terms that you need to understand that no sooner had she walked in through these doors with her hips swaying like she fucking knows the place, that I march her out of those other doors and shoot her dead. I shoot her and it's at this point, it's at this point that your perspective of me breaks down. I shoot her all the way to her virtual grave and everything we've established since the curtain came down is lost. We'll have plenty of time to think about this later and for those of you who survive to relive this moment, to replay it and revisit it as if there will always be a part that escapes sense in making sense of the experience. 
Sometimes Ogre and Minerva will be a 26 sure made up make up counter assistant, and at other times you might think that she was just let in here to shake things up a little, but regardless of this, she will be the first execution and death, and with the sing of war that will make you no longer want to sing, no longer want to dance, and no longer want to act, or you will step out of high heels and onto broken glass. You will walk on red carpet and sing of the brevity of mortality and how you've been deprived of your right to a normal life.